There you go. Good morning. Great to see everyone here at Memorial Heights Baptist Church. If you're visiting or you're joining us online and uh, you're new, uh, my name is Pastor DJ. I'm so glad that you're part of our service today. Before we begin in song, I want to begin with some scripture this morning because the song that we're going to start with today comes from the scriptures. And uh, it's from Psalm 126, which says this, 
When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue was singing. Then said they among the heathen, the Lord hath done great things for them. The Lord hath done great things for us. Whereof we are glad. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. We've been sowing some tears, we've been sowing some struggles, but we're going to reap some joy today. And let's give the Lord the praise for that as we stand and sing. Why don't you sing this hymn out from your heart as we lift it to the Lord, bringing in the sheaves. fighting for yourself. It wasn't just for us. It was for our family. You will renew the structure of your mind. It's a way you think. When we realize trying harder, it's not going to work, and we understand grace, then all of a sudden we can start moving into sweet revenge. And I watch the Congress series. I not only believe what they're saying is true, but I think it could be true for me. It works. It's freeing men. So we can be more than a conqueror for our daughters and for our sons. Starting the Conquer series, that's for our guys who are seniors in high school all the way up to senior adults, starting September 12th, Saturday morning, 8 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. That's going to run for 10 weeks. And uh, I know that many of you are not a part of that, but I want you to show you, I want to show you that video because I want you to be praying uh, for that study and for that series as we come together. Right now we have about 10 guys uh, that are signed up. I've been praying for uh, 12 to 15 guys. And so we still have, we're really close to that number. Uh, we still have a couple spots that I would love to have filled. And maybe that spot's for you, or maybe that spot is for somebody that uh, you know. Maybe you've been thinking about it, or you've been on the fence. Uh, this is a great, great study. This is not just for guys 
uh, who are involved in some kind of sexual addiction. This is for all men. And uh, all of us will benefit from this. And uh, let me just again read you some statistics. I'm not going to read all of them that I read you a few weeks ago. By 40 million Americans, uh, regular visitors to porn sites. Uh, the annual revenue of the porn industry, more than the NFL, NBA, and MLB combined. Uh, more than ABC, CBS, and NBC combined. 47% uh, of families in the United States, that's not Christian families, that's families. 47% of families in the U.S. Uh, state that pornography is a problem in their home. It increases the marital infidelity rate by more than 300%. 56% uh, of American divorces uh, state that one or more of the members of that marriage who are getting divorced had an obsessive problem with pornographic websites. 68% uh, of church-going men, 50% of pastors view porn on a regular basis. That's those who admit to it and when surveys are done. Uh, so this is an absolute crisis in our culture, and uh, we're not going to sit idly, idly by. Only 7% uh, of pastors say that their church has a program to help people who are struggling with pornography. And so we, uh, we want to be one of the 7%. We, we'd love to increase that number so that there are more churches who are involved in helping people with this need, this, this crisis that is oftentimes just getting swept under the rug. And we see the consequences uh, for that in our culture, in our families, in our churches. And so we're uh, going to be praying uh, about that. I hope that you, even if you're not part of that, that you'll be praying for this study. And again, if you know somebody or you have been somebody who's been thinking about this, uh, being part of this, I'd encourage you to either talk to me or talk to Pastor Nick today, and we'll get you uh, signed up for that. Uh, also want to tell you uh, about something that was uh, brought to my attention just a few days ago uh, called the Prayer March 2020. This is something that Franklin Graham has, it has planned. Uh, how many of you have heard of the Prayer March 2020? Okay, a few of you. Uh, there's a video I think we got. Great. Thank you. I threw Linda a bunch of curveballs today, and she's hitting them all out of the park. So thank you, Linda, for that. But why don't you guys check out this video, and then I'll just make a few quick comments. As I stand in our nation's capital, this country's in trouble. The only hope for America is God. And on the 26th of September, I'm holding a prayer march right here on the mall. And we're going to go from what's behind me, the Lincoln Memorial, all the way down to the Capitol, praying for this country as a prayer march. Prayer is our most important weapon. It allows us to go directly to the King of Kings, directly to stand in front of the throne of grace and make our petitions known directly to God. I believe in prayer, and I want you to join me right here on the 26th of September at noon on this mall as we march from one end of this mall to the other, praying for our nation. Well, Lord willing, Gigi and I are gonna be there on September 26th, and we would love for some of you guys to go with us. And so what we're gonna ask you to do is to uh, let the office know this week, either by Facebook or email if you need to call in. Uh, and so I'm throwing Stacy a curveball uh, this week uh, too, this, or this morning too. Uh, if you guys could uh, let us know uh, sometime this week, let Robin or Stacy know uh, that you're interested in that. Once we see how many people might be interested in going down, uh, we'll figure out transportation, we'll get all that worked out. Uh, but we would love for you to go uh, with us uh, in prayer for our nation. Uh, as I said uh, the other night, if the church is not praying, uh, things are not going to change. Th things are not going to change because of some politician or some political agenda. Or the, What is going to change America for the better is prayer. Uh, because uh, we have problems that only God can fix. And so we need to bring those problems to the Lord. So we're going to be there. And as part of that incentive and part of that um, prioritizing for our church, uh, what we're going to do, and again, this was uh, something that Gigi and I had talked about, and this was really uh, uh, her idea as we were talking about the importance of prayer. Uh, we are going to ask that you will join with us for five minutes every day during lunch in prayer for our nation. Now, I know many of you are already praying uh, for our nation. You, that's part of your daily prayer routine. But I think it uh, is important for us to know that we're praying together and that we're praying at the same time. And so sometime uh, between 
most of us take lunch between noon and one o'clock. If, if you would set aside five minutes during that hour every day uh, to pray for our nation. And uh, we have um, uh, a little reminder that's going to come up every morning on Facebook. For those of you who are on Facebook, uh, we're going to um, uh, pop this reminder up at 7 in the morning to remind you to be praying uh, at noon. And what we're going to ask you to do when you see that is, uh, if, if you're going to be part of this, to like it and to share it so that it is throughout the day, throughout those five hours until noon, noon that it's spreading so that other people will be joining us. We don't want this to just be our church. Uh, we want as many people, as many Christians as can uh, to be praying with us for five minutes uh, from 12 to 1 every day in prayer for our nation. There are some bullet points that will be on that uh, to give you some, uh, some general categories. And then along with that, if you think, I know some of you might be thinking, how do I pray for five minutes? Uh, well, believe me, once you get started, there is so much to pray for. Five minutes can go by very, very quickly. Uh, and so don't feel like you have to stop at five minutes. But if you need some help getting started, uh, I've also added some, some more specific things that you can pray for. Uh, be, be praying for our president and other leaders and, and, and things like that. Get a little bit more specific. But I hope that you will join us uh, in prayer five minutes uh, every day. And that will uh, start uh, posting tomorrow. So please join us with that. Uh, just one more thing before Butch comes with uh, the prayer requests and to lead us uh, in any birthdays, sing for any birthdays that we might have. Um, Carly McCulloch called me last night, uh, and she just wanted to uh, express, emphatically express her great appreciation and her thank you to the church for all of the prayers for Bob, all of the cards that they've received, that the encouragement that, uh, that we have been to them. Uh, and so I, I appreciate uh, our church coming together around them as, as uh, uh, we lift up, continue to lift up Bob in prayer. And uh, uh, one specific thing that they've asked that as we pray for Bob's rehab and pray for Bob's recovery and pray that Bob would be able to regain his speech. Uh, he is supposed to, at, right now, he's scheduled to move out of the rehab center um, and into a nursing home for rehab on September 4th. And uh, not only would that be um, less intensive rehab, but also the family would not be able to visit him. And so we are specifically praying right now that uh, we can get that extended so that he'd be able to stay in his rehab longer. So as you pray for Bob, uh, please pray not only for his recovery and rehab, but he, that he would be able to stay uh, in the current rehab where he's at in Altoona uh, longer into well, as, many, as, long as, as long as God would allow. Uh, because he's, he is making progress, uh, and we want to continue to see him make that progress. So uh, with that, Butch, if you, uh, I know you got some announcements too. I'll pass it off to you. Okay, this to the announcements. Uh, this came over our one call. If you got uh, the one call, the community playground project. Okay, volunteers are needed tomorrow at 9:30 a.m. to help we paint, tear down old playground equipment. Uh, the church has been um, has made a donation to this project, and this is a great way to serve our community. The playground will provide a safe place for uh, kids to play outdoors, and will also be used as a ministry location for future sidewalk Sunday school. It's a Center Street playground across from Fox's Pizza in Cumberland. Okay, so if you're interested in helping on that, in on that uh, it's tomorrow at 9:30 a.m. Okay, and then next, uh, we have any birthdays? I didn't get anybody's birthday today. No one came to me. But I do have another good praise. I have uh, Charlie and Debbie right here sitting. They just had 50 year anniversary. 50 years, folks, that's good, isn't it? <laughs> Congratulations. Uh, so with that, we'll go into our prayer time. Um, we want to pray for Kenny Hart. He's gonna have a surgery on his back Wednesday. Uh, and they're having a lot of hope that this is going to help them. And uh, I want to also lift up George Fogel's family. George Fogel's brother passed away unexpectedly. So pray for George and his family. Uh, Bill Harden has been uh, back, moved from the nursing home back to the hospital. He's not going too good with his legs. Uh, so pray for him uh, and their family. And the um, we want to pray for uh, Edie's family. Uh, Joe had passed away. We want to pray for them, the ED family, and also for um, Sherry sitting over here. She's going to have surgery uh, Tuesday, 
So we want to pray for her, and then we want to continue to pray for Chris Grace, who's making some progress. And uh, uh, Bob McCall, of course, was just mentioned, and we certainly want to pray for them. We've got a long list here, so it's a lot to pray for. But we just remember them this week as we go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, that we have the privilege of prayer. We have, and Lord, that we have a God that hears our prayers. Lord, we thank you that we can come right straight to the throne of grace because of what Christ has done for us. And Lord, we ask you, Lord, to hear our prayer requests this morning, every one of them, Lord. Uh, you heard them by name. I pray, Father, that uh, you would uh, give an answer, Lord, to all those prayers, Lord. And may it be a positive answer, Lord, uh, for those who uh, need healing and for those, Lord, who need some answers that only you can answer, Lord, and we know that God, you can do that, because for with God, nothing is impossible. So, Lord, we're praying for those folks. We turn them over to you, Lord. We turn out every situation over to you, Lord, and we ask you, Lord, to be with the families, Lord, and, uh, and we think about those who also lost loved ones uh, this week, and we know that um, we uh, pray especially for my cousin and his wife, girl, uh, girlfriend, Lord, and as they lost, she lost her mother, and Lord, for George and his uh, family. And for the uh, Edie family, Lord, as well, Lord. So, Lord, we just uh, know that there's a void there that only you can fill and comfort. And we ask you, Lord, to fill that void as only you can. Lord, we're here today to hear your word preached. Uh, we ask you to use our pastor in a mighty way. Uh, we ask you to anoint him from head to toe. We pray, Father, that your spirit would have full reign here today. Lord, that uh, there would be decisions made by Christians. But most, most importantly of all, Lord, if someone here has never accepted you as their personal Savior, that they'll accept you today. We'll give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, as we lift our prayer request to the Lord, let's continue to lift our praise to the Lord. I'm going to let you stay standing, or stay seated, excuse me, <laughs> stay seated. Uh, I'll stay standing as we uh, continue to worship the Lord in song together. <laughs> Sing with me. Oh Lord, you're my shepherd. You make me lie in fields of green. You lead me by the still waters. You restore righteousness to me. Though I walk through the valley, I will feel no are with me and you comfort me. Surely goodness, love, and mercy will follow wherever I go. Surely goodness, love, and mercy will follow wherever I go. Surely Testimony. 
says he is, he'll do what he said he'll do, and we are who he says we are. We serve an incredibly loving and gracious Father. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in on his love. He's always there with us. He never leaves us. I'm chosen. 
go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you. We do as uh, your children. We do trust you. Uh, we thank you for the many blessings that you have given to us, that you've given to our nation. God, the freedoms that we uh, do still enjoy. Uh, but God, uh, our nation is under assault. And many of those assaults are from within. And God, we, uh, we need you. We need to uh, reaffirm our trust in you and strengthen our faith in you. And so, God, uh, we pray that you would uh, hearken unto your people and hear our prayers and answer our prayers uh, for our country, God, so that we can continue to live in peace, that we can continue to spread the gospel freely. And, God, we pray that as we go through this crisis, God, in our nation and the world, that the church would respond with boldness, that we would respond with grace and love, God, that we would speak the truth of the gospel, the hope of Jesus Christ, God, the only true hope that there is in this world, the everlasting hope of the gospel of Jesus. Father, we lift up the name of Jesus today, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. The year was 1980, and Al Michaels asked the world, do you believe in miracles? Amen. Yes! Now, he wasn't speaking at a Billy Graham crusade. For those of you who are younger may not know what I'm talking about. He was commentating a hockey game, but it wasn't just any hockey game. It was the miracle on ice. A ragtag team of amateur U.S. hockey players, the youngest team in the Olympics that year, the youngest team in American hockey history at that time, up against the four-time gold medalist, five out of the last six Olympics gold medalist juggernaut, professional caliber Russian Soviet team. Now it wasn't for the gold medal, but it was in the medal round and it led them to be able to compete for the medal, which they went on to, uh, to beat Finland and win the gold medal that year in the Olympics. But this was the moment, the victory of the American team over the Russian juggernaut, the miracle on ice that enabled them to go on and win the gold medal. Sports Illustrated in 1999 declared it the greatest sports moment of the 20th century. And I want you to believe in miracles with me for a moment. I want you to use your imagination. I want you to think of yourself as an Olympic gold medalist. Miracles, right? I want you to believe for a moment that you have just won an Olympic gold medal. You have spent years, likely at least a decade, maybe multiple decades, training, preparing for this moment. Now maybe hockey's not your thing, maybe you're more of a Simone Biles or a Michael Phelps or a, a Kurt Angle fan who uh, won Olympic gold while wrestling with a broken neck. Quite an accomplishment. But whatever, whatever event, whatever sport, you have just won the gold medal. The, the medal is around your neck. You can feel its weight on your chest. The national anthem is playing. Don't you kneel for that anthem. You're not just representing yourself or one group of people. You're representing the entire country. You're representing the uh, men and women who have given their lives over the years and decades and centuries for our freedom. And you are now a national hero. We're going to walk down the cereal aisle and we're going to see your picture on a box of Wheaties. <laughs> we're going to stand in the checkout line. And if you're like me, you've always seemed to pick the longest checkout line. And you're going you're gonna to look, and there's going to be your face on the cover of not just Sports Illustrated, but People Magazine. You're a national hero. You have achieved your life's dream. Now what? Now what? Do you know some of these medals from this team have been auctioned off. Now, I know at least one of them, I'm, I'm not sure about all of them, but I know at least one of them was, it was done for charity. 
But decades after this amazing event called the greatest event, sports event of the century, this medal that these guys, and again, they didn't win the medal in this particular game, but it led them and enabled them to go on and win the medal. They don't even have the medal anymore. Think about the Super Bowl champions who have sold their Super Bowl ring because they've fallen on hard times. Maybe some of them have done it for charity, but many of them have done it because of hard times. All of this work. And, and I in no way want to minimize or belittle what it takes to win an Olympic gold medal. I mean, that is, that is an a, a amazing accomplishment. And some of these athletes, not, not all of them, but some of them deserve to be national, national heroes. But what then? What then? I want you to turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 4, and we're going to consider the limits of human achievement. The limits of human achievement. Now, my goal for this study as we get farther and farther into the book of Ecclesiastes is to spend less and less time on the review portion. But because we are in the book of Ecclesiastes, we need, we need to spend a little bit of time on review. Because this is not like any other book in the Bible. In fact, none of the books of Solomon, Song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes, Proverbs, none of them are like any other book in the Bible. They are unique to each other. They are unique to all the other books in the Bible. And so we need to be very careful in the book of Ecclesiastes to understand where in the book we are. Because most people, I suspect, I don't have any hard data on this, but I suspect most Christians, most people think of Ecclesiastes like Proverbs Part 2 or Proverbs the Sequel. And you know how sequels are. They're, they never quite live up to the original. Oh, occasionally you get a... Empire Strikes Back, or you get a Wrath of Khan. But most of the time, the sequel is not as good as the original. And what happens in Ecclesiastes is sometimes we, we reach our hand down into the bag and we pull out a verse of Ecclesiastes and we look at it and we expect to find a proverb. And, and there are proverbs, we'll, we'll actually see a couple proverbs in this chapter. There are proverbs in the book of Ecclesiastes, but there's a good chance in the book of Ecclesiastes that you'll pull out a verse and you'll look at that thing and you'll go, what is that doing in my Bible? And so what many Christians do is they just kind of put that back in the bag and they think, you know, I'll just go back to Proverbs. I'll just go back to another book of the Bible. I, I, I don't want to mess with this book. And, and what a tragedy. What a tragedy. Because if we understand the context of what we're reading, we'll see that this is one of the most amazing books that God placed in our Bible. This is an incredibly relevant book. The word Ecclesiastes from the Greek ekklesia, from which we get our English word, our, it translated into our English Bibles, is church. This is a message for the church. This is a message the church needs to be preaching because Ecclesiastes proves the case for why we need the Great Commission. It proves the case for why we need Jesus. It proves the limits of life without Jesus, and the utter futility, the eternal futility of life apart from Christ. So I like to think of Ecclesiastes and Proverbs. They are similar, the same author, but I like to think of them as two different ways to drink your coffee. My wife uh, made me a coffee lover uh, just a couple years ago. I, I would not touch this stuff. I like the smell of it, but I wouldn't, I, I couldn't drink it. I tried. I oh. But now, I start my day with coffee, I end my day with coffee. I don't care how late it is, if I haven't gotten all my coffee, I'm gonna drink it. Uh, I have a four-year-old, so I'm gonna go right to bed anyways. I don't care how much caffeine I pump into my system, I'm going right to sleep. So, I have at least two, uh, sometimes three coffees, uh, big coffees a day. But when I drink my coffee, I drink it with a lot of milk. A lot of skim milk. I, I, I lighten that thing up. And that's really the book of Proverbs. I mean, what better way to start your day than with a proverb, a chapter in the book of Proverbs, and a cup of coffee? What a great way to start every day. Ecclesiastes, though, is taking your coffee black. It's dark. It's bitter. But it will wake you up. 
And some of you have had a late night where the only thing you could get was some black coffee and you had to sip that thing and you had to drink it slowly. Now some of you like, like your coffee black. You, uh, I don't know, I don't know what to say to you, but uh, <laughs> that's not me, I'm not there yet, maybe someday. But, but I bet many of us have had to, to try to stay awake and the only thing we could get, we didn't have any creamer, we didn't have any sugar, we just had to drink that thing black and, and we had to sip it down, but it kept us awake and it got us where we need, got us to do what we needed to do. And that's the book of Ecclesiastes. And so very quickly, let me remind you what we've seen. This is, this is Solomon's search for the prophet of life. And chapter 1 is the introduction. It's where Solomon states the universal problem that life is fleeting. Life is a breath. He asks the universal question, what is the prophet of an everlasting life? And then he commits to the search for that meaning. Chapter 2 is the search itself, the research methods, what he did. And, and we see in the first 10 verses that he tried this and that, and he failed, and he failed, and he failed. And, it, and, and he concludes in chapter 2, even in this life, even under the sun, these things don't give lasting value. And so he doubts, and he despairs. But then he turns to God at the end of chapter 2. God's discipline. He doesn't talk about God's discipline in Ecclesiastes. We read about that in 1 Kings. But God disciplines him and he turns his heart back to the Lord. And Solomon realizes that God is the only true source of knowledge and understanding and joy. And so in chapter 3, his tone completely changes. And in chapter 3, Solomon does three things. We talked about these three things last week. Let's just very quickly review. He says, uh, first of all, he reframes the crisis, the question, the crisis. And he does it by telling us that life comes in seasons. To everything there is a season. And a time to every purpose under heaven. Life comes in seasons. Not only is life fleeting, but the seasons of life are fleeting. And we can't control those most of the time. Most of the time, the seasons change without warning. Sometimes overnight, sometimes in the middle of the night, the season changes. But each one has a divine purpose. We need to expect change. We need to expect challenges in this life. He reframes the crisis. He restates the question. And he says again in chapter 3, what, what's the profit? But then he he goes on to say that, that beauty will fade and the questions will remain. Beauty is something that God has created for its time and its time, but in this life, beauty will fade and questions will remain. And so, yes, I'm going to answer the question, Solomon says, but understand I can't answer all your questions. And God is not obligated to answer all of our questions. He'll answer some of them, but he has limited us because of sin He's limited our understanding. He's limited our enjoyment. He gives us pleasure, but it's temporary pleasure. He gives us understanding, but it's limited understanding. Travail is inevitable. And again, we need to expect challenges. We need to expect uh, uh, constraints, limitations. But the answer to the question, he reveals the answer to the question, and he says in chapter 3, fear before him. Fear before him. If you want to get profit out of your life, you need to fear God. What does that mean? It means that we, need, that we need to live in awareness of our accountability to him, Solomon says. We need to, to, to live in the awareness that for everything I say, everything I do, I'm going to stand before God one day and I'm going to give an account for that. If I will live that way, live preparing for that day when I will stand before God, if I'm fearing him, in my life. Solomon says, you are going, you're not going to have all your questions answered. Beauty is still going to fade, but something is going to remain for all of eternity that is going to have lasting value. Now, of course, we know today that God that we're going to stand before is Jesus Christ. Jesus hadn't come yet. We have, we actually have knowledge and revelation that Solomon didn't even have. You will stand before Jesus Christ. And the only way we know today to be prepared for that is to confess your sin to the Lord. To, as Romans 10 says, call upon the name of the Lord 
to be saved. We need to understand who Jesus is and what he did and why he did it. And we're actually going to be starting a new series tonight uh, on the book of Galatians. We're going to be talking about that and getting very specific about the gospel. But what you need to know, to know today is that you need to be aware that you are a sinner. That you are under eternal condemnation. Apart from turning from your sin and turning to the only one who can save you, Jesus Christ, who came to this earth. God, the Son of God, became a man. He lived a sinless life that you cannot live. And he died a substitutionary death. He shed his blood to pay for your sin. He literally, physically died. But he, three days later, according to the scriptures, literally, physically rose again. And so as the victorious living Savior, the God-man, he is able to extend this offer of forgiveness to you. It's the only way that you can stand before God. It's the only way that you have any standing before God. And so it's the only way that you can have, have any eternal value to your life. Otherwise, Solomon says, if we're, not, if we're not living that way, we are just living the life of an animal. We're living the hopeless life of an animal. So enjoy and engage in the work that God has given to you in this season of life. Now, only God knows what the future holds. So fear him. Live for him. See what God will do. Now, chapters 1 through 3 reveal the problem, what Solomon went to, to do uh, to work on the solution, and then the solution. Now we are entering into chapter 4 in the bulk of this book, chapter 4 through 11. And what he's going to do now in chapters 4 through 11 is he's going to defend his thesis. This is a research paper. This is maybe the first research paper ever written. I don't know. But it's, it's uh, the best one ever written because it's uh, written by God himself, the Holy Spirit, who inspired Solomon. And so now that Solomon has given us the answer, he's going to spend the next bulk of this book, chapters 4 through 11, proving that his answer is the only answer. That the only way you can find profit in life that lasts beyond this life is to fear God. And so the first thing that he does is he defends this thesis as he presents his finding and explores the data is he talks about the limits of human achievement. The limits of human achievement. Sand castles are beautiful. They're amazing. I've, I've seen, you have seen, I'm sure, some incredible sand castles. But sand castles do not last the night. The tide is going to come. It's going to wipe it out. And if I'm not living for God, if I'm not living for Jesus Christ, all I am doing for however many years or decades, or even if God gives you a century on this planet, all I'm doing is building a sandcastle. So, human achievement is great. God wants you to achieve things in your life. We'll see. But apart from him, it's all going out with the tide. So, what are the limits of human achievement? Well, notice before we dig into this book together that Solomon is going to put the answer that he discovered, the fear of God, He's going to put it to the test in four areas. He's going to talk in this chapter, chapter 4, he's going to talk about power. Can power give me meaning in life? Here's why it can't. Number two, he's going to talk about work. Can my job or can what I do to, um, to keep myself busy, can that give meaning to my life? He's going to show that it can't. Number three, relationships. He's going to show that the relationships are limited. And then he's going to close with a story that's really about renown, renown, the limits of renown. And so as we go through this chapter, these are the four areas that we're going to look at. In uh, verse 1, I returned and considered. He talks about power then. In verse 4, again, I considered. He talks about work. In uh, verse 7, I returned and saw. He, he talks about relationships. And then in the end, he says in verse 15, I considered all the living. And so I want you to consider some things as we go through this chapter. Look with me, first of all, chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. And let's talk about some of the consequences of power. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 1. So I returned and considered all the oppressions that are done under the sun. And behold, 
Behold means look at this. Pay attention. Listen to what I'm saying. Behold the tears of such as were oppressed, and they had no comforter. And on the side of their oppressors, there was power, but they had no comfort. They had no comforter. Wherefore, I praise the dead, which are already dead, more than the living, which are yet alive. Now again, this is one of those verses that if you just pull this verse out and think it's a proverb, you're going to go, what is that doing in the Bible? But remember the point of chapter 4. The point of chapter 4 is to prove the thesis that life apart from God is meaningless and that you have to fear God. I praise the dead, which are already dead, more than the living, which are yet alive. Yea, better is he than both they, which hath not yet been, who hath not seen the evil work that is done under the sun. Here's the first thing I want you to see today from chapter 4. Power corrupts and oppresses by its nature. You've heard that. Power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. Where does that come from? Well, it comes from the record of human history, but Solomon talks about it here in Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Power can only steal comfort. It cannot give comfort. It can steal comfort, it can take comfort away from you, but it can't give it to you. There are powerful people who know comfort in their life, but it, the comfort does not come from their power. They may, be, they may have a relationship with God, they may be right with God, and so there are public officials and there are people with great amounts of power who, who have comfort in Christ. But no one is ever comforted by their power. Even, my, my dad likes to say, uh, hurting people hurt people. Hurting people hurt people, meaning that if somebody is hurting somebody else, they're, they're probably projecting some pain that they have inside, some, some inner anger that, that they're expressing. That's why they're oppressing people. And oppressing people doesn't give any comfort to that. It just multiplies the problem. It may give you some grim or sadistic sense of pleasure, but that's not comfort. That's just your sin nature uh, uh, consuming itself like a cancer. Or like gangrene. Power corrupts and, and oppresses. Now, this isn't in the PowerPoint, but as we talk about oppression here, because of all that's going on in our country today, let me, let me back up just for a minute. And I want to warn you about two spirits that invade this discussion whenever we talk about oppression and easing oppression. The first is the... Absalom spirit, and the second is the Judas spirit. Let's talk about the Judas spirit quickly. When Jesus was about to be crucified, when he was in Bethany, something incredible happened that Jesus said would be talked about everywhere the gospel went. He had resurrected Lazarus from the dead, and Lazarus' sister, Mary, brought some incredibly expensive ointment to anoint Jesus. She brought in this alabaster box with this incredibly expensive ointment. Uh, 300 pence is what it cost. A pence it, to give you the, to, to do the math for you was about a day's wages back then, a, a normal workman's day's wages. So 300 days wages it cost to buy this ointment. And she took it and she broke the box and she poured it over Jesus' head. And as the oil was flowing down Jesus' hair and flowing down his face, she was anointing him, and the people began to, Mark 14 tell us, began to murmur. Murmur, 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 murmur. What, what, what a waste. This should have been sold and given to the poor. Pastor Nick was talking about grumbling. And the last couple of Sunday nights, appreciate him uh, on all that he said. And, and uh, many of us uh, have been convicted over the last few Sunday nights about Murmuring and grumbling. Well, they were murmuring. Murmur, 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 murmur. Why were they murmuring? Mark 14, people were murmuring. Well, Matthew 26 says it's because the disciples were murmuring. So as the disciples murmured, it spread to other people. And everybody started to complain about this woman who's given this gift to Jesus. Why? She, this should be given to the poor. But John tells us in John chapter 12, that the one who started the problem, the one who started the murmuring, was Judas Iscariot. Why was this not sold and given to the poor? John says, 
Judas didn't really care about the poor. Judas was the treasurer. And he wanted to skim something off the top. And so he used charity as a way to fleece people who were giving to Jesus' ministry. I've seen this happen. This happened, in, I won't name the, the charity, but this happened in our own community just a few years ago. But a charity that had to be shut down because people involved were skimming money. I know uh, of a Christian organization. This was not made public. But it's a national Christian organization um, that the uh, secretary was skimming money and that was supposed to be going to churches and it was going to her feed her addictions. I think she had a gambling addiction or something like that. I think that's what it was. So beware of the Judas spirit who tries to talk about the poor and tries to talk about charity, but it's really only so they can manipulate and make money themselves. But the Absalom spirit is even more dangerous. The Absalom spirit we read about in 2 Chronicles chapter 15 and in 2, uh, Chron or, excuse me, 2, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 15. And Solomon um, it was brothers with Absalom. Absalom ended up dying, but Solomon, this was his older brother. Absalom had some issues, fam major family issues. Uh, his, well, uh, let's, let's not soften it. I mean, his, his brother raped his sister, and uh, King David, because he didn't know how to handle the situation, he just tried to ignore it, and um, Absalom killed his brother for doing that. And so David had to kind of punish him, but then he let him come back. And David, in his, his older days, he made some really bad decisions. And that was one of them. And Absalom, when he came back, he came back with an agenda. He was bitter against his father because of what he had allowed to happen, because he didn't deal with the problem. And so he decided, you know what, I would make a better king than my dad. And so he decided he was going to steal the throne from David. So here's how he decided he was going to go about that. It came to pass after this that Absalom prepared him chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him. And Absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the gate. And it was so that when any man that had any controversy came to the king for judgment, came to David, that then Absalom called on him and said, oh, oh hey, I'm the prince. What, what, what city art thou? And he said, well, thy servant is one of the tribes of Israel. And Absalom said unto him, see, thy, thy matters are good and right. But there is no man dep uh, deputed of the king to hear thee. Absalom said, moreover, Oh, that I were made judge in the land, that every man which hath any suit or cause might come unto me, and I would do him justice. And it was so that when any man came nigh to him to do him obeisance, he put forth his hand and took him and kissed him. And on this manner did Absalom to all Israel that came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. Be very, wary, be very wary of those who want to convince people that they are victims, that they've been victimized. They don't care about the people's victimization. They care about getting power. And they know that if they can get people incited against the rightful authority, that they can take power. That's the absolute spirit. Have you seen that? Anywhere recently? Have you seen that happening in our country? Trying to incite people, tell them they've been victimized. Oh, if you would come to us, this is what communism has done all over the world. Trying to tell, coming into a nation, telling people they've been victimized, but we will, we will make it right. We will make it right. Do you know one of the most common forms of, of oppression that we read about in the Old Testament is over-taxation? The Bible talks about that as a form of oppression. In fact, Solomon's son Rehoboam is going to implement incredibly high taxes as a form of oppression, and it's what's going to divide the nation. The very thing that some people say will heal our nation, we'll just increase the taxes so that we can give to those who have been oppressed is what communists have used throughout history 
uh, over the last hundred plus years to gain power. And they're not concerned about the victims that they claim to be concerned about. See, power corrupts and oppresses. Power cannot bring lasting meaning. If I could just be in control, well, guess what? That power is going to corrupt. If you, if you don't follow Christ, if your eyes are not on Christ, that power will corrupt and we see it. And so you may think, well, you know, I'm, I'll never be a politician or I'll never be in a position of authority uh, over, uh, you know, the state or the nation. But have you ever used power to oppress? Have you ever used your position at work or even in the homes or at church or, or wherever to, to oppress people, to try to make them do what you wanted them to do? Be very wary of those who would try to make people think they're victims so that they can manipulate them into doing uh, what they want. And, and we know that that's the spirit behind what's going on in our country because, because, of, how, because of the selective outrage. The selective outrage. Do I use power to oppress? But here's, here's the other thing, guys. We, we need to be very careful that we don't just call out the lies, but that we also speak and act in truth. I need to ask myself this. Do I ignore the oppressed? Say, well, I'm not, an, I'm not oppressing people. I'm not like those, you know, those BLMers. I, I don't, I don't, I'm not oppressing people. I'm not marching in in neighborhoods and trying to wake people up and threaten them and, and do all these things. But do I ignore? Do I stay silent when people are oppressed? Or do I comfort the oppressed? We're, we're not going to take the time today to go, to go to Luke chapter 10, but Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10. And he says that if you really want to love your neighbor, you need to get your hands dirty. You need to make some sacrifices. When you see somebody in need, it's not the government's job to fix that. The government's job, Romans tells us, is to uh, punish evil, to restrain evil. That's what the government, the government does not exist. There's nowhere in the Bible that says the government exists to make sure that everybody gets fed and that everybody has a, a living wage. And every That's not the government's role. The government, the government can't function that way. Everywhere that's been tried, it's been a disaster. But it's our job when we see needs, to meet those needs. Proverbs uh, chapter 21, verse 3 says, To do justice and judgment is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. So we need to be people who uh, all aren't oppressing, uh, we're not ignoring, we are comforting those who are oppressed. And so uh, that's the first set of questions I would ask you. The next thing I would ask you is, how do you respond to oppression? When you do feel oppressed, when you are legitimately oppressed, do we respond with fire? You know, fire to fight fire. Evil to res respond to evil. Romans chapter 12, uh, such a, uh, an amazing, a humbling passage of scripture where Paul uh, tells us that verse 9, love let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor, preferring one another. Verse 13, distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you, verse 14 says. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but Condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it is possible, it's not always possible, but if it is possible, as much as depends on you, or as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Again, we know the spirit behind what's going on because of how it's responding to evil. It's responding with more evil. If there is injustice, don't respond with more injustice. 
If there is systemic racism, don't respond with a different kind of systemic racism. Overcome evil with good. And then he says here, uh, do I realize, do I realize what Solomon realized? Maybe you missed it in verse 3. Yea, better is he than both a which hath not yet been, who hath not seen the evil work that is done under the sun. I take incredible comfort from this and from other verses, chapter 6 and, and Job chapter 3. I forget how evil the world is, despite all that goes on around me. But Solomon wants us to understand that God is still merciful on those who have never been born. The Holocaust of abortion, the great, the great evil of our day. The slaughter of my generation. I was born just a, a few months after, really weeks, after Roe v. Wade. My generation and the following. The, the, the tens of millions that have been murdered in the womb. Out of convenience, the blood sacrifice to Satan and his kingdom that this has been in our culture. And yet, Solomon says, you know what, really, they're better off because they're in the hands of God. Listen to what he says in chapter 6. Uh, we'll jump ahead just for a second. Chapter 6, verses 3 through 6. If a man beget an hundred children and live many years so that the days of his years be many and his soul not be filled with good and also that he hath no burial, I say that an untimely birth is better than he, for he cometh in with vanity, with a breath, and departeth in darkness. His name shall be covered with darkness. Moreover, he hath not seen the sun or known anything. This hath more rest than the other. That's not just poetry. That's not just, ah, he's better off. That is the promise of hope. I'm not going to take the time right now. Maybe, maybe when we get to chapter 6, we'll go to Job, Job chapter 3, where Job talks about this as well. But those children, and you know, Gigi and I have had four uh, miscarriages. I don't have to worry about those. I don't have to worry about those kids. They're with Jesus. They won't come to me. We'll go to them. I have to worry about the son that I do have. <laughs> That's enough to worry with. That's enough to worry about in this world. And as much as I would have loved to have been able to worry for those other children, um, I know they're in the hands of Jesus. Amen. And so we have to take comfort where we can. As evil as abortion is, and by the way, this is not some justification for it. That, that's, don't speak like a fool. You're going to stand before God. Don't say something stupid. I saw some friend of a friend on Facebook. Well, it, it's, it, you know, I grew up in the foster system, and it's just better for them to be aborted than to be unwanted. What an abomination. What a demonic thing to say. And, and you will stand before God with that attitude. God is the judge. God is the judge. Power corrupts and oppresses. Look at verse 4. Success inspires envy. Boy, what, aren't you glad you came to church today? Isn't this an uplifting message? This is reality, guys. This is your reality check for the week. Success is envy. Why can I not just work hard and why can't I just, just leave me alone, preacher? Why can't I just work hard? Here's why. Because even when you're successful, verse 4, again, I consider it all travail Every right work that for this a man is envied of his neighbor, this also is a breath. It's habet, it's habel, it's a vapor, and vexation of spirit. Uh, let me just say very quickly, don't be driven by jealousy. Proverbs 14.30 says, A sound heart is the life of the flesh, but envy the rottenness of the bones. Envy is uh, rottenness to your bones. Don't be the one who does envy. But understand, the moment you have success in your life, somebody's going to be bitter. Somebody's going to be jealous. Somebody's going to want to take it from you because we live in a sinful culture. And so the more success we have, sometimes the more people hate us. It's corrupt, it's evil, but it's true. Galatians chapter 5 after Paul says, uh, you know, we need to live in the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, etc., he says, let us not be desirous of vain glory. 
provoking one another, envying another one, envying one another. Envy is hostile to the fruit of the spirit. Envy is the opposite of the fruit of the spirit. If I have envy in my heart, uh, I will not have the fruit of the spirit evidence in my life. They, they can't coexist. But the reality is, unless people are Christians who have the spirit and are walking in the spirit and submitting to the spirit, envy is the rule of the day. Success inspires envy. Don't be driven by jealousy. Number three, power corrupts. Success inspires envy. But you, you might think, well, then I just won't try. I'll just, I'll just relax. But apathy leads to laziness, Solomon says. You say, I can't win. That's Solomon's point. Apart from Jesus, you can't. Apathy leads to... To laziness. So that's why Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord, not unto men. You're not working for men. Don't work for men's approval. Because you'll find out the people that you think are going to be so happy for you are just going to end up envying you. Work for the Lord. Don't be lazy. Solomon uh, says elsewhere, Proverbs chapter 6, go to the ant, sluggard. Be wise. Consider, consider the ant. Be wise. Work hard, but understand that you're working for others and ultimately for the Lord, not just for yourself. Uh, that kind of uh, apathy leads to laziness, leads to self-destruction. Don't just live for yourself. Don't just work for yourself. Live for the Lord. Power corrupts. Success inspires envy. Apathy leads to laziness, but hard work must be tempered with contentment. Listen to what he says. Listen, listen to this proverb. I, I love this proverb. Let's look at verses 5 and 6. The fool foldeth his hands together and eateth his own flesh. Better is a handful with quietness than both the hands full with travail and vexation of spirit. So Solomon uses the hands as an illustration. He says some people fold their hands, right, like you're, like you're sleeping. That's going to lead to self-destruction. Your laziness will lead to self-destruction. But some people go the opposite extreme and they just want to work, 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 work. He says that's foolishness too. What you need is to find a balance between hard work and rest. That's where you're going to get, and, and the only way you're going to do that is if you understand contentment. Boy, this is a problem in the church today. Boy, it's a problem in my life. Contentment. Content with what we have. Don't overwork. Beware of the seductive power of money. Paul reminds Timothy, godliness with contentment is great gain. Paul said to the Philippians, not that I speak in respect of one, for I have learned. This is something you have to learn. This is not going to come natural. You're going to have to learn this. But you can learn whatsoever state... I am therewith to be content. Paul said, I, I know what it is to have a lot, and I know what it, has, what it is to have nothing. And the key is in trusting in the Lord. That's the key. If I'm working for the Lord and I'm trusting in the Lord, then I can be content. So if I overwork, it means I'm not really trusting the Lord. I'm not content with what I have. I'm trying to get more and more and bigger and better and newer. And there's nothing wrong with that in moderation. There's nothing wrong with new, with bigger, with better, in moderation. But Solomon says, listen, work cannot provide lasting meaning. Hard work must be contempered, must be tempered with contempt, contentment. Number five. Ambition pulls toward isolation and self-absorption. Listen to what he says next. I returned and I saw vanity under the sun. There is one alone and not a second. Yea, he hath neither child nor brother. Yet is there no end of all his labor. Neither is his eye satisfied with his riches. Neither saith he, for whom do I labor and bereave my soul of good? This also is vanity. Yea, it is a sore travail. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath no one 
uh, not another to help him up. Again, if two lie together, then they can have heat, but how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. And a three cord, uh, threefold cord is not quickly broken. So with whom and for whom are you working? I um, know of a man, I was talking with a pastor about this. Um, he said that he had, this is not this church, this is not this area, okay, not, not Cumberland. Uh, but I was talking with a pastor who, who was sharing with me some troubles that he had with some of his trustees. And the problem was uh, the head deacon wouldn't work with anybody. And the pastor went to the head deacon, or head trustee, excuse me, and, and said, you know, you need to get, we got all this stuff to do, you need to get somebody to help. You need to ask so-and-so to help. You need to ask so-and-so to help. He said, they do it wrong. They do it wrong. I have to do it my way. Well, you're doing it by yourself. Well, it's got to be done right. It's going to be done my way. Didn't want to work with anybody. Couldn't work with anybody. Had to, be, had to have it his way. And a lot of us, we're not as honest as he is, but we're like that. We want it done our way. It's got to be our way, my way. And so we don't work with each other the way that we should. We don't uh, invest into each other. With whom and for whom are you working? Listen, you need to invest your resources into the kingdom of God. You need to invest your resources. Don't just work for yourself. Don't just work, you know, my eyes aren't satisfied. I don't have contentment. I'm just working for myself, working for myself. Solomon says, verse 8, that's just vanity. That's, that's Hable. That's a breath. It's a vapor. No one to enjoy things with. You need to work together. So we need each other. Not to be codependent, but to be interdependent on one another. And the, the greatest way that we do that as Christians is by working together for the kingdom of God. Ma Matthew 6, uh, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things shall be added unto you. That's how, verse 20, he says that you lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. We need to be wise. I love what, what uh, Jesus says in Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16, he tells the parable of the unjust steward. I won't take the time to unpack all that, but, but here's, how he, here's how he ends the parable. He says in verse 8, The children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. Worldly people, he says, are smarter and wiser than the people who have the knowledge of God's word. And what does he mean by that? He says, And I say unto you, Make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when ye fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. He that is faithful in that which is least, i.e. money, is also faithful in much. And he that is unjust in that which is least, i.e. money, is unjust also in much. If ye therefore have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, which who will commit to your trust the true riches? Jesus said, if you want to, you have, there's nothing wrong with having a lot of money. That's a blessing from God. But how do you invest that money? Jesus said, if you're smart, you'll invest it. If you're smart, you'll invest it. Now, the world, worldly people who are wise with money, they know, hey, invest in the stock market, invest in... And, and Jesus isn't saying play the stock market. Jesus, though, is saying, if you are wise, you will invest into eternity. You'll invest in evangelism. You'll give to missions. You'll give to the church, which is about missions, which is about getting the gospel and making disciples. And, and when you die, Jesus said... Don't you want to get to heaven and see how God took something as worthless as money and turned it into eternal friendship and eternal relationship because of the people whose lives were changed? People who heard the gospel of Jesus Christ because you gave and you helped get that person on the mission field or you helped that ministry get the gospel out or you invested the time to do that yourself. Do you think you're going to care? The sacrifices that you made in this world when you get to that one, you won't care. So invest your resources in the kingdom of God. Invest your time and energies into others. D 
Do you, do you just hang out with acquaintances? Do you spend all your time with just people that you have contact with? You know, I have a long contact list on my phone. People on that list that aren't even alive anymore. I just haven't gotten around or I just, you know, it feels weird to delete them. I just, but I go through, sometimes I go through my contact list looking for somebody specific and I'm like, I haven't talked to them in 10 years, I haven't talked to them in 20 years, I haven't talked to them in blah, 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 blah. This huge contact list, but who am I really connected with? Not just have a, as a contact, but I'm really connected with. If I really love God and love others, I'm going to be co-laboring with people. And that's really how friendship is built. Eternal friendship. Lasting friendship. Laboring together in the gospel. So power corrupts and oppresses. Success inspires envy. Apathy leads to laziness. Hard work must be tempered with contentment. Otherwise, hard work is itself self-defeating. Be aware, though, that as you work hard, that ambition will pull you towards isolation. It will, it will pull you towards self-absorption. You have to be intentional about working with others. And then here's the last thing as we uh, prepare to close. Admiration is fickle and fleeting. Admiration is fickle and fleeting. I bet I could read you a long list of Olympic athletes, of celebrities, who those of you who are 60, 70, 80, you would know who I'm talking about, but everybody younger than that would go, who was that? What did they do? People who used to be the center of the world's attention, who now, this generation doesn't even know who they were, what they did. Listen to what Solomon says here. He, he tells a tale of two kings, and I believe... Uh, that this tale is really a retelling of the story of King Saul and King David in, in very brief summary. Here's what Solomon says back in uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Better is a poor and wise child than an old and foolish king who will no more be admonished. For out of prison he cometh to reign, whereas also he that is born in his kingdom becometh poor. I consider all the living which walk under the sun, which the second child that shall stand up in his stead. There is no end of all the people, even of all that have been before them. They also that come after shall not rejoice in him. Surely this also is vanity and vexation of spirit. Solomon's thinking, I believe he's thinking about his dad here. He's saying, when my dad was just a kid, such a godly young man, and he became the hero of the nation. You remember the song, right? After David killed Goliath. Saul has slain his thousands. David is ten thousands. And how did that old and foolish king respond? By becoming older and more foolish. And the, David captured the heart of the people. He had to hang out with prisoners. Literally here, this, this is where it says, uh, for out of prison. Literally, it's the house of the prisoner. David was hanging out with prisoners. He was hanging out with ruffians when he was fleeing King Saul. And eventually he, he replaced Saul. He came to power. God anointed him. God chose him. But what happened later in his life? Well, we already talked about it. The story of Absalom. The heart of the people turned from David to David's younger and better looking son who made all these promises. And David as an old man found himself in exile once again. On the road, hiding out, the hearts of the people that had praised him had turned away from him and turned to his son. And Solomon reflects on that and he realizes that, you know, power corrupted my dad to a degree. It corrupted his wisdom. And all that praise that men heaped on him, it was fleeting. It lasted for a while, but David made a lot of mistakes. People got mad. People didn't like it. And they turned their hearts to someone else. Solomon says, surely this also is vanity and vexation of spirit. As we close, I want to remind you what Jesus said in John chapter 2. Well, what is said about Jesus in John chapter 2, Jesus, John tells us, did not commit himself to people, 
because he knew all men and had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Jesus didn't get excited when he had crowds of people following him because he knew that that's capricious. He knew that that's fleeting. He knew what was going to happen in the end, that they were going to, many of them, most of them would turn on him. Instead, as we see Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane in Luke chapter 22, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Don't, don't trust in the praise of men. The moods of men are fickle. Trust in the faithfulness of the Father. The only way to find meaning in life is to fear before him. Let's go to prayer. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness to us. We've looked at some harsh realities today. We've looked at some difficult things today. But God, let us remember the faithfulness of our Father as demonstrated when you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to die for my sin, for the sins of the world. And you raised him from the dead. And God, you've forgiven me of my sin. you brought me into your family. You've made me your child. God, may I remember every day of my life that my eternal hope is in you and my eternal rewards, rewards only come when I fear you and live for you and lift up the name of your son, Jesus Christ. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you stand as we close with a hymn? We won't extend this but we do want to give you an opportunity to respond. If you have a need, the deacons are here to pray with you. If you don't know Jesus Christ, he's the only one who can give your life eternal meaning. For those of us, though, who have made that decision to trust in Christ, let's lift up this song as a testimony to him. ask, God, as we sing this song of dedication, commitment to you, God, that we would be reminded that you are the source of every good and every perfect gift. God, that we have hope because of what you have given us in Jesus Christ. And Father, I pray that as we leave here today, we would remember that every breath is a gift from you, that this life is a gift from you. God, we, we want to have we want to have a life of meaning and a life of profit and a life of value. So God, may your spirit go with us and remind us that we will give an account to you, that only in you can we find true meaning. So God, may we every day take up our cross, may we take it up daily and follow you in obedience, knowing that God, you will reward those who diligently seek you. We love and praise you. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. We hope that you'll be back tonight. We'll be in the book of Galatians. We'd love to have you here. Uh, God bless you.